The reason I wanted to lean into this is because what Nehemiah faces is something that while different is essentially the same as what many of us face. Nehemiah was, he saw the brokenness in the world around you. Does anybody see brokenness in the world around you? You see brokenness in, in our, our nation. We see brokenness in our world. We see brokenness in our community, in our families. We don't have to look very hard to see where the walls have been broken down, to see where the enemy has overcome, We see where people are struggling and settling for far less than the best that God has created them for, living in places of hurt and pain and isolation and, and, and in captivity. And Nehemiah recognizes this. Israel has been captive. He is a captive. And he looks back at the walls that are broken down. And he says, this is not okay. It's not okay, the brokenness that I see. I, I heard a, a guy preach once. He says, look, the, the things that you are most pained about are the things that God is calling you to step into. The places where you feel that pain and you feel, you look at it and say, no, 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 it's not okay. And that might be very different from what I look at. We might agree, hey, yeah, it's not okay, but there's something that you see in this world where you look at it and say, I cannot let that be. There's a calling that God has put in your heart to step back into the places of brokenness and begin to see his kingdom rebuilt. Nehemiah was called to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall, but we've been saying it wasn't about the wall. God wasn't saying, man, what we really need is more walls. It was about an identity of a people. It wasn't about building a wall. It was about building a people, an identity that these are my people and I am with you. I am protecting you. I am providing for you. I have a future for you. The wall was symbolic as much as it was practical to say that God has not abandoned his people and he has a future for them. And he calls Nehemiah to step back into this ministry of rebuilding places that were broken. And of course, when we step into places where the kingdom the kingdom of God wants to invade the kingdom of this world, the enemy is going to come against that. The enemy is going to stand against us and try to distract us, try to undermine us, try to destroy the work of God that he wants to do through us in the world around us. If you are not on mission for God, you are not a threat to the enemy. And if you step into mission, and you step into this idea of saying, I am, you're missionaries, but we are missionaries into all the dark places and all the lost people that God has given us, we will face opposition as we lean into the callings that God has given us. When he got this calling, uh, just a quick summary to get us to where we are at the end of chapter 6, he immediately goes into prayer and fasting for days he immediately seeks, he embraces the burden that God gives him. He goes into prayer and fasting for it. God gives him favor, and he steps out of the life of his comfort and back into a place of, of challenge. As he does, there's several different things that come against him. This opposition that he faces that we also face. He was distracted. He was threatened to be distracted by people who wanted to call him away. I know you're building the wall, but come down to this little villa, the, the valley of oh no. <laughs> come down to this place and let's meet together. And they were, one, they were trying to harm him. They were trying to kill him, but also they were trying to stop the work. Don't worry about the work. It'll get done later. Don't worry about the mission. Somebody else can take care of it. Don't worry about what God has called you to do. Step out of that and into something else that's going to distract you from it. And the Bible says that's a place of, oh no. It's a place of danger. He avoids that because he says this. He says, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. When we're on mission when we're focused, the great work that God has given us is the thing that keeps us from falling into the distractions. I hear the young men say, Jesus is everything. I hear the, the, they're willing to be tortured and kidnapped and all these horrible things, and, and they're saying, no, that doesn't pull them away from, from God. It drives them deeper into resolve. This is, we will not be deterred. God, I want that. We're so comfortable in this world. Lord, would you give us a sense of mission that we will not be distracted from? He says, my work is important and I'm not going to get distracted. The second thing he faced is lies. There was, uh, there was people who sent out open letters and, and they said all these lies about him. They said, oh, it's reported among the nations that you want to overtake the king and that you're actually in rebellion. 
And, and he it is sent as an open letter, as a public Facebook post for everybody to see. And these lies are being spread about him. And so what does he say? He says, nothing like you say is being done. You're inventing these things out of your own mind. And he says, now, O oh Lord, strengthen my hand. He just stands up. He says, this is not true. And I'm not going to spend my time fighting against the lies, fighting against the rumors, fighting against the gossip. I'm not going to spend any effort on that stuff. Lord, strengthen my hands to stay on focus. When people lie about us, when people say things that are not true about us, when people put things out there and they try to undermine our character, we say, you know what, I'm not going to... I think my dad is the one who taught me the saying that says, never wrestle with a pig because you both get dirty and the pig enjoys it. We don't, we don't get dirty. We don't, we're not going to lower. We say, no, I'm right. I have a great mission. Lord, whenever, when I feel the opposition, when I feel the lies, when I feel the gossip, when all that, I'm not going to be a part of that. Instead, I'm going to say, Lord, strengthen my hands to continue to do what you've called me to do. Last week, we talked about enduring spiritual compromise. And he is, there's a, a guy named Shemaiah who asks Nehemiah to come to his home. And when he comes to so this guy is, is homebound. We don't know why, but he's homebound. When he comes, he says, let's, there are people coming to kill you, Nehemiah. Let's go to the temple and let's hide. Nehemiah has two responses. Do you remember? He says two things that are important to our identity in Christ. First thing, he says, what kind of man do you think I am that I'm going to run and hide? Because I'm, I'm not the type that hides. I have a mission. I have a calling, and I'm not hiding. And so he has this great strength and confidence. But he also has this incredible humility because he follows that up by saying, and who do you think I am that I would disobey God and I would, I would go into the Holy of Holies? He knew his humility under God put him in a place that says, I, he goes, I am strong enough in who I am that I will not hide from man, but I am humble enough before God that I will not break the law of the Lord. I will not do those things because I'm not so great that I can profane the holy of holies. I have enough honor and respect for God that I have, I'm humble under him, but I'm confident because of who he has called me to be. And that humility and confidence gives us identity to walk those places of danger. So the last one I want to talk about today, as long as my voice holds out, is that God helps us. There's, there's a fourth trial that comes his way, a final trial we see at the very end of chapter 6, and then we see the solution to it in the beginning of chapter 7 of Nehemiah. So if you want to follow along, you can go there. We're going to look at Nehemiah 6, chapter, or chapter 6, verse 15. So, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul. In 52 days, which is incredible, for years and years and years and years, for generations, that wall had been broken. One man on mission, one man embracing the call of God, one man stepping in and the wall is built again because of the grace of God in 52 days. And when all of our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, this is interesting. In those days, the nobles of Judah, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah. Tobiah, if you remember, was one of the, the guys, one of the, the ones who were trying to destroy the work that God was doing, trying to stop what God was doing. So you have a guy who's actively an enemy of the mission of God, and there are nobles in Judah that are communicating regularly with him. They sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. And for many in Judah, because many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son Jonah Hanan. And had, okay, so all the, he's married into the family, and his son had married into the family. People who were the enemies of God had married into the people of God for multiple generations now. And they had worked their way into places of influence. And what does it say about them? Verse 19, it says, They spoke of his good deeds in my presence, and they reported my words to him. And Tobias sent letters to make me afraid. These people had... 
were enemies of the mission of God, but they were partnered, they were married, intermingled with the people of God. And rather than the people of God who had a mission from God say, no, if you're not on mission with us, with God, then we're going to choose the side of the Lord. They say, you know what? We're going to play both sides. We're going to play both sides here. We still, he's a man of influence. He's a man of power. He's, he's been my friend for a long time, but he's a part of my family. And all these reasons why they kept somebody who was an enemy of the things of God in their life as an influence in their life, actively interacting with them. This influences, and they would send him letters talking about Nehemiah. And he would send them letters back. And these negative influences were beginning to, to erode the confidence and erode the mission of God in these people of God. There's an ungodly influence in their lives. Tobiah was different from Sam Ballot and the others. He wasn't an Israelite. But because he had married, he had deep influence in the community. But Tobiah hated this rebuilding effort, and he hated Nehemiah, and he sent letters to him to make him afraid. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's a whitewashed tomb. He showed up wearing the right things with the right people, but his actions were against the mission that God had given them. Unfortunately, a lot of people fell for his hypocrisy, and he became an influencer in these people's lives. Who are the influencers in your life? Whose voices are you listening to? Who are the ones that are speaking to you that are shaping your sense of identity and purpose and calling and values and vision? Who are the people that you're trying to please because their opinion of you matters to you? No matter what Nehemiah said, he couldn't get the people. I, one guy I saw online, he put it this way, he couldn't get the people to unsubscribe from Tobias' podcast. Because he was really entertaining. He was, they were really connected to him. Have you ever heard of the uh, ant death spiral? Has anybody heard of the, the ants do a death spiral? Curious. How many of you have heard of that before? You got like three of you in here, right? So there's a certain kind of ants. There's these army ants. I got a picture of it here. <clears throat> they call it a death spiral, the, a spiral. These ants don't navigate by vision. They navigate by smell. And so what can happen, on, as they're going somewhere, they can smell the pheromones of the ants that have gone before them, and they follow that. And they follow it blindly. Wherever that, the ant before them had gone, they follow along. Without any thought, without any decision making of their own, they just smell it. And, and it works really well when the first one has gone somewhere. There's food, and he goes to get food and comes back. Now everybody knows how to get food, right? Because they have followed the, the, the sense of direction. There's a leader who's left a trail in front of them, and they follow that direction. If it's going in a good direction, they survive, and they find food, and they do it together. They stay in these massive groups, and they're able to defend themselves and take care of each other carry more food and more resources than they could on their own. It's an incredible system that God's created for them. On occasion, the lead ant will end up in a spiral. He'll walk in a circle. And because he walks in a circle, the, the pheromones that he leaves behind him, the ant behind him also walks in a circle. And now there's two of them that have walked in a circle, and now a third one walks in that circle. And eventually they begin to spiral, circle, circle, circle. And the more that spiral, the more that walk in that circle, the stronger the pheromones are that they're leaving, the more it appears to all the other ants that this is what we're, where we should be going. And they begin to walk in this circle and they will continue to do that until they die of exhaustion. The whole group of them will walk in circles until they die. Because they're blindly following the voice, the influence of the person in front of them, of the ant in front of them. Out of curiosity, I was like, okay, well, what, is there any way for ants to get out of that? So that's amazing that that happens, that we could just talk all day about how that applies to our lives, right? How we blindly follow, or if we care for who we're following and the directions they're leading us because we can end up in spirals that lead us away from the mission and the call of God in our life and put us in places where so much has died. What can get them out of it, though? 
How does an ant get out of a death spiral? And this is what I read. I read on the internet, so it has to be true. It says, usually ants cannot escape the spiral of death. However, it's not impossible. Sometimes, due to external influences like wind or rain, the loop can break. What do they call it if, you, if you're at your house and wind or rain damages your roof? What does the insurance company call that? An act of God. They will, they will fall into a death spiral unless there is an act of God that comes in and breaks the loop, that breaks the cycle, that wipes away the influence and gives them a chance for a fresh start. I don't need to preach that. That preaches itself. We can get caught in a spiral in the media, a spiral of fear, a spiral of worry, a spiral of chaos. We can get caught in a spiral of negative influence of people around us, a spiral of all of these different voices. So many ways we can get caught in the spiral of chasing our own tails, and there's an act of God that wants to come in and say, no, that's not your purpose. I have a direction for you. Don't listen to the Tobias. Don't interact with the people that are pulling you away from God. Don't let their voices be the voices of influence that are spiraling you away from the mission of God and the call of God in your life. Let an act of God shake you up, break up that spiral and say, where is it that I'm supposed to go? Where's the food? Where's the help? How do we, how do we expand and grow the things that God has given us? How did Nehemiah deal with Tobiah? How did he break the death spiral that Tobiah was trying to create in the people of God? Chapter 7, verse 1 says this, Now when the wall had been built, and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, and the singers and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem. For he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. It's noteworthy here that Nehemiah, unlike the other times, he doesn't say anything to Tobiah. He doesn't say anything to the letters. He doesn't write letters of his own. In all the previous situations, he had some sort of response. I'm on mission. I'm not going to be distracted from it. Nothing that you've said is true. Lord, strengthen my hands. Like he, he had these responses. But here he doesn't give any response. The response to the negative influencers is this. I'm going to surround myself with gatekeepers and worshipers and men who are faithful. I'm going to replace... The negative influences, the negative voices, the, the voices that are causing me to spiral. I'm not even going to spend any time fighting that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put in place people that are going to help accomplish the things that God has called us to. The antidote to the negative influences is positive influences. It's not fighting in the mud. It's standing with the people that are going to be on mission with us. Three different groups, really, he mentions here, and I want to mention them briefly, and we'll close. Gatekeepers. What was the job of a gatekeeper? If you have a build a wall, you set up the, the doors, and you set up a gatekeeper, the gatekeeper's keeper's job is to monitor what comes in, who comes in, and who goes out. And the people who should be in, they make sure they get in. And the people who should go, they make sure they're able to go. And the people who should not come in, the voices that should not be in, when the enemy comes against them, the gatekeepers are the ones that stand up and say, the enemy is coming, drop the gates. Close the doors. The gatekeepers protect the city. We need gatekeepers in our life. Now, you guys are probably a lot closer to perfect than I am. But I need people in my life that are willing to look at me and say, Jason, that's stupid. Don't do that. Jason, that's the wrong choice. 
You should not be pursuing that. You should not be doing that. You should not be watching that. You should not be listening to that. That's not who God has called you to be. I need people to help be gatekeepers in my life. To say, look, the things that you're letting into your life are not the things that are going to help you accomplish the mission of God in your life. I need people who are gatekeepers, who will help protect me, who will speak truth into my life. He also brings in singers and Levites, worshipers, the people who are going to direct the attention of God, of God's people to the, the character and nature of God. The people who are going to say, I need people in my life who are Levites and worshipers, who are the ones who when I'm around them, I am encouraged in the Lord. My perspective changes. I, I see again the importance of who God is and what he's doing. They call us to worship. Shane and Key and Mike up here today were not just performing a concert. They were Levites and worshipers calling us to join them and drawing our attention to the ultimate truths, to break the spirals of chaos in our lives and to look above it and say, Lord, you're worthy. Look what you have done. Look who you have been. We need gatekeepers to help us. We need worshipers. We need people in our circle who draw us closer to the Lord. When I walk away from being with that person, I feel like I'm more hungry for God than ever before. You need those people. And the last group that he mentions is his brother Hanani and Hananiah, who was one of the leaders. He says this about him. He was more faithful and more God-fearing than almost anyone else. If you want to overcome the ungodly influences in your life, you have to surround yourself with godly influences. People who are more faithful. People who are going places you want to be with the Lord. People who don't look at your compromise and say, yeah, that looks like fun, I'm in. But rather they say, you know what, that's not who we are. I give my boys a hard time. I appreciate it. Uh, they play video games online, and a lot of the kids online are always cussing. And my kids are always like, language! Like all the time, language! And the people online get mad at them, and they cuss at them more. And they're like, nope. Okay, the, the kind of people that when we say things that are stupid, they look at us and say, language! They look at us and say, that's not who you are. That's not who you're called to be. That's not what God has given us. There's better. When you want to spiral, they are the act of God that pulls you out. Flip side of that, and I'll close with this, is not only do we need those people in our lives, we need to be those people. Are you that person for others? Are you the person who pulls others towards God and away from the brokenness? Are you the person who says, no, 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 We're gonna, I'm going to be a gatekeeper for you and that we can't allow. No, no, I'm going to be the worshiper in your life. I'm going to draw your eyes back to the Lord when you want to look in the mud. I'm going to be the person that's faithful and I'm going to lead and I'm going to stand strong and say God has called us to something greater and we're not going to get caught up in, in, in the backbiting and in the godless and in the distractions. Do you have those people? Are you one of those people? Bow your heads with me if you would. <coughs> There's seasons in all of our lives where we're really strong in, in, in following the Lord. And there's other seasons where we're really struggling and distracted. And that's normal because we're broken and we're sinful and that's who we are. But the influences in your life will cause you to follow a direction. The voices you listen to on the television and on the internet will cause you to, to lean in a direction. And you need to examine carefully the Tobias that you let speak into your life. If you're in here, you say, you know what? Pastor Jason, that's... That's interesting, but I'm far from God right now. My life is spiraling. It's not going the places I want it to go. How do I get out of this? 
in the Bible, it tells us that Jesus came, that God in flesh showed up, an act of God to destroy the death spiral of sin. That every one of us is, is stuck in that spiral of death. The wages of sin is death. What we earn when we live our own way and follow our own ways and we don't follow God's ways, what we earn is death. But an act of God, Jesus shows up and he pays the debt. He pays the price. He gives up his own life <clears throat> so that you and I can be forgiven and that we can be free. God gave up his life. He died. He suffered. He took on shame. He took on sin so that you and I could be forgiven. Maybe you're in here today and you feel you're stuck in that spiral. You're far from God and you say, I need Jesus to break that in me today. I, I need his forgiveness in Jesus' name. I need to change my direction and I want to follow Jesus today you're here and that's you, you say, I want to follow Jesus today. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray over you. I want to pray for you. Yes. Yes. Lord, I, I thank you for the hands that were raised. Just like each and every one of us, we've all been in that moment where we raised a hand, where we knelt before you and said, I can't do it on my own. I really need you, Jesus. I, we pray, Lord, if you raise your hand, we just pray. There's no magic words. Just say, Jesus, forgive me for my sin. Jesus, I trust in you. Save me. Save me, Jesus, and show me what it means to follow you. There's not a magic prayer that we give. It's a heart that calls out to God. It says, Jesus, I put my trust in you. Lord, I pray that as we pray that prayer, Holy Spirit, would you just fill their hearts? Would you come rushing in like a flood? May they feel your presence. May they feel your grace. May they feel your forgiveness. May something in them react. Your, your word says that the Holy Spirit is a confirmation, is a seal confirming to us the salvation that Jesus has given us. May they experience right now a confirmation, a seal from the Holy Spirit that their life is changed, that the old is gone, the new has come, the old man is dead, and somebody brand new has come alive for the first time in their life. Jesus, would you save I pray. And Lord, for the rest of us who are so easily tempted by the Tobias, who are so easily called to look aside and, and to call to compromise, who are called to, to get caught up in the, the ungodly influences of this world. Lord, surround us with good influences. Surround us with gatekeepers. Surround us with worshipers. Surround us with men and women who are faithful to you and your word, who continue to call us to better places, to more faithfulness. And God, help us to be that person for others. May I be the kind of person that causes others to love you more, to seek you more, to hunger and thirst for righteousness because of my influence in their life. As we go from this place, we go back into the place of darkness. We go back into the place where we're missionaries. Send us today as missionaries, Lord. Send us today as a people of influence so that your kingdom can grow, so that your loved ones, the people, the, the children you love can be saved. Lord, send us today in Jesus' name. Amen.